45 minutes to clean it up, right? Or whatever you There's want. a natural breaking yeah. point, yeah. Thank you very much. So I want to, first of all, uh, thank uh, Vlad and Daniel for inviting me here to give these lectures and to visit the Hausdorff Institute. And I want to thank Daniel for arranging a tearful reunion with my long lost luggage yesterday. So that was, uh, <laughs> that was a joyous occasion. So um, let's see. So I'm, the, the, as, I, as uh, Vlad says, the, the title of the lectures are Equations Defining Projective Varieties. And the idea is that this is, a, I want to talk about a circle of ideas that somehow lies at the interface of algebra and geometry. And so the idea is that if you kind of tautologously, a projective variety is the locus and projective space cut out by some polynomial equations. But if you give yourself a variety and ask what are the equations defining it, you get to sort of various interesting questions. And these have been studied classically. So they're, I mean, I'll talk about this in a minute, they're classical theorems with Casanova and Petri and so on for curves. And, the more recent classical work of Mumford and Kempf and a billion varieties and so on. And the idea is that there are really a lot of interesting geometric uh, ideas that have been used to sort of study these questions. So my hope is to try to survey some of these and try to entice people into some of these uh, the kind of different methods that come up. The, the, I'm also going to talk about a circle of ideas that's kind of related to what you might think of as the computational complexity of projective varieties. So if you give yourself a variety, how long does it take when you're sitting at a computer to, uh, to compute it? So anyway, that's the idea. And so as I said in the announcement, <coughs> I'm going to try to organize things around the algebraic questions, but I'll try to focus on the geometric method. And so what I want to do for the first half of this talk, so the first 30, 45 minutes, something like this, is give a general introduction to the kind of things I'm going to be talking about. And then the second part, we'll try to sort of get a little bit more detailed. So as I said, oops. So I want to start with an uh, introduction. Whoops, so I haven't learned how to use it. OK. And I want to start the introduction by uh, recalling two very classical theorems and some of the questions they uh, they suggest. So let's start with the first theorem in the cohomology of sheaves on projective space. So this is Sayre vanishing. So, let's, so what's Sayre vanishing theorem say? So you start with a, a coherent sheaf on some projective space P. So <clears throat> for some of what I do, I won't really care uh, what the dimension of the projective space is. So this is just some projective space. I'll just write P when I don't really care about the dimension. And so, as you know, coherent sheaves are kind of rather intricate objects. But what Sarah showed, of course, is that if you twist it up by a sufficiently high power of the hyperplane line bundle, then everything, all the sort of subtleties, the cohomological subtleties disappear. So Sarah's theorem, as we know very well, is that there is some integer m0 depending on f, so that, uh, so that if uh, we take some integer m bigger than this m0, then uh, <coughs> if we twist by at least by m, that uh, renders f globally generated and it kills the higher cohomology. So then, uh, then first of all, f twisted by m is globally generated. And second of all, the Sayre vanishing is that the higher cohomology of f twisted by m vanishes. So once you twist a coherent sheaf sufficiently, all the cohomological subtleties disappear. So what's the question that this suggests? So this sort of the, let me say, question one is, can one find an effective estimate on what m0 is? So can one find, give an effective, a specific, for m0 of f. So if I give you a sheaf, is there some kind of finite series of calculations you can do to figure out what m0 works in Sayre's theorem? I think historically, uh, this kind of question first came up uh, to prove the basic boundedness theorems that you need to prove when you construct Hilbert schemes and quote schemes. Because basically, what you need to show is that if you have a sheaf f that's realized as a quotient or a subsheaf of a given sheaf, then you can bound this m0 in terms of just the Hilbert polynomial. So this is kind of uh, 
But uh, for our purposes, another uh, sort of an example of why we might be interested in this kind of question if we're interested in defining equations is that what does this say if f is the ideal sheaf of some subvariety or some subscheme? So let's consider uh, x in projective space, uh, some subvariety or subscheme. Then what is this m naught telling us? So and yeah, so we'll take uh, the ideal sheaf of x. So so this is the ideal sheaf, and then uh, let's let m naught be some value of m naught for this ideal sheaf. So then what is this telling us? So then what it's saying is that if we know where ser vanishing starts applying for this ideal sheaf, it's saying first of all that. Uh, well, what does it mean to say that an ideal sheaf twisted by some specific thing is globally generated? That means that uh, x is cut out by hypersurface, so x and p is cut out as a scheme by hypersurfaces of degrees uh, uh, m naught or m naught or less, right? Because to say that a twist of an ideal sheaf is globally generated means that hypersurfaces of whatever degree you're twisting by cut out x as a scheme. And then um, what about the vanishing of the higher cohomology of the ideal sheaf? Well, the classic, I mean, that there's one kind of very classical piece of information that contains, which is the question of whether or not hypersurfaces trace out a of a given degree trace out a complete linear series. So then also, so then the and let's see, I don't know, if, am I caught in the shadows here? Or, oh, OK. And uh, hypersurfaces of degrees uh, k greater or equal to m0 trace out, I think that's the classical word, a complete linear series on x. So in other words, so in other words, it's, I'm afraid I'm going to have to. In other words, the restriction maps rho k from hypersurfaces of degree k on projective space onto uh, the sections of the corresponding line ball on x. This, these maps are surjective. Right, because this is equivalent to the vanishing of the h1 of the ideal sheet. So this kind of question about what degree, if you take a variety in projective space, what degree hypersurface cuts out a complete linear series is the kind of classical way of asking when does the H1 of the ideal sheet vanish. So these are the kind of um, uh, classical kind of questions that come out of knowing when, how you make ser vanishing effective. So now I want to go back to a sort of change, mention a second classical theorem. So this is a classical, th again, I'll, uh, no, let me, so this is the second classical theorem I want to mention. This is, various people have thought about this, but I'll say Castel Novo et al. And and so this is here, it's a question of what happens if you, what about the equations defining algebraic curves? So uh, let's let, uh, C be a, a smooth projective curve of genus G. Genus G. And then let's let L be a line bundle on C of some degree D. OK, so people were interested in, you know, if you look at the embedding defined by the complete linear series given by L, what can you say about its algebraic properties? So Casanova's theorem is that, first of all, if uh, the degree of the line bundle is at least 2g plus 1, well, then we know very well that the line bundle is very ample. But the point is that it embeds C as a, as a projectively normal curve. So then L defines uh, an embedding. Uh, C and P R, and R in this case 
by Riemann rock is just d minus g. So we're always looking at the complete linear series uh, in which c is uh, projectively normal. That's the assertion. So in which c is projectively normal. So in other words, i.e., these row, all these restriction maps are surjective for all k. So if you embed a curve by a line bundle of at least degree at least 2g plus 1, then all the hypersurfaces of all degrees trace a complete linear series on x, which is equivalent to saying that the affine cone over x is a normal surface, normal surface singular. So this is called projectively normal. And then secondly, if you go a little bit higher in degree, so if the degree is at least 2g plus 2, then, in fact, the homogeneous ideal of C is cut out, is generated by quadrics. So as soon as you embed a curve by a complete linear series of degree at least 2g plus 2, it's cut out. The ideal is actually generated by quadrics. And again, this is precurs, but like Mumford and Kempf and others looked at analogous questions for uh, Boolean varieties. In fact, I think so Mumford was concerned, I mean, he really wanted to develop an algebraic theory of theta functions to construct moduli. I think he has a series of papers on equations defining Abunian varieties, certainly in the first volume of Invencionis, maybe even the first issue. But there's that. So this is the, but I'm on, for the moment, I want to just focus on curves. So the picture here is you have a certain amount of positivity. You get a projectively normal embedding. You have a little more positivity. You get an embedding cut out by quadrics. So the kind of the natural question to ask here, and it's surprising that nobody seems to have actually done that classically, is what happens if you go even further in degree? So what happens, so presumably some good thing should happen if you go up to, let's say, 2g plus 3. But uh, I think classically people hadn't really looked at this. So I'll explain in a second. This is, was Mark Green who realized that this is bringing us to these questions of syzygy. So, so these are the two questions. But now continuing my introduction, I want to sort of say a little bit about what the answer is. So I'm not going to prove anything now. I'm just trying to kind of survey the landscape. So these are the questions. And then let me say a little bit about what the answers will be. OK, so now <laughs> here comes the really scary thing, right? OK, let's see. Do I do the whole board and then? Uh, <laughs> All right. Is this a good sign or is this a bad sign? Yes. So I'll t while, while we're waiting for Joel, I'll tell my story. So my. Uh, Working or no? So when I was, whoops, uh, when I was in Michigan, where you know sports were taken very seriously, when my son was about ten, so the Michigan, the athletic department had a contest, and uh, you could, for kids, and you could sign up for this contest, and if you won it, you could be a ball boy at a basketball game. So he did this, and he won. <laughs> so this meant he got a very good seat at the basketball game, and he got a T-shirt. But it turned out his duty was to take a mop. And as soon as there was a pause in the game, he had to run out and mop the floor. And so, <laughs> so I've always thought that we, you know, if the mathematicians were more organized, we could have board boys, you know, and they, <laughs> they could get a, you know, a Max, they could get a Hausdorff Institute T-shirt, and you know, in the pause in the lecture, they could come. <laughs> but anyway, maybe that wasn't okay. So in any event, I see I'm out of stories here, so I'm going to have to. What do I do? Do I just charge ahead and hope for the best? Is that Okay, so let's. So this first question. So what? So the first question was, uh, how do you make Sare vanishing effective? And the answer is with something called Castelnuovo. So sort of answer to the first question is with Castelnuovo Mumford regularity. So let me say a little bit about what that is. 
And so this is going to be uh, one of the topics. Uh, basically, the thing I'm going to talk about the end of today and some amount of time next time. OK, so let me give the definition, which isn't necessarily that instructive. But OK, so one says that a sheaf f on projective space on some projective space p. Oh, I see, but this is getting the chalk wet. Well, OK, so this is, I haven't mastered this yet. OK, so we need to, on a projective space p is a, uh, is m regular for some number m in the sense of Casanova Mumford if, uh, so it's a specific set of vanishing. So what you ask is that the higher cohomology of f twisted by m, the i cohomology twisted by m minus i should be 0 for positive i. OK, so it's not necessarily a terribly intuitive definition, but we'll see shortly where it comes from. But the important thing is if you're on an r-dimensional projective space, you're checking r minus 1 specific vanishing. So it's just some specific collection of vanishings that you need to check. And so what's the sort of basic fact about this? So it's an elementary theorem of uh, Mumford that uh, if, um, if this condition holds for some m, so if uh, f is m regular, I guess I'll do it like this. Uh, then, um, then what? So then, this uh, we're in the situation of zero vanishing. So first of all, f twisted by m is globally generated, and uh, second of all, uh, uh, let me call this condition star sub k, uh, star sub k. So for all k being equal to zero, well. Well, let's say k being equal to 1, doesn't matter. Uh, stars this condition holds, which is that if you know the sections of f twisted by m, you can, that those determine the sections of higher twists of m. So there's a map like this, and that these maps are surjective. OK. Uh, uh, I'm, well, OK, let me, let me I'm, I just want to say this. Uh, let me call this both ones. So first of all, f twisted by m is globally generated. And the sections of f twisted by m determine the sections of higher twists of f. And then second of all, uh, this regularity is inherited up. So if it's m regular, f is also m plus 1 regular. OK. So this is an elementary uh, theorem. But the, uh, the point then is that this regularity is really kind of the answer to this question of how do you make Sarah vanishing effective. So in other words, so the yoga, let me put it here, is that if we define, if we define the regularity of f, so to be the minimum of all the m's so that it's m regular, So this regularity, uh, so I'm sorry here, I'm not being very systematic, but I'm going to go down here. So this regularity controls the cohomological complexity of f. So in other words, if we define the regularity to be the least m that makes f m regular, then basically uh, yoga is at m0 of f. We can take m0 of f to be this regularity of f. So this castle novo mumford regularity is the answer to the question, how do you make Sarah vanishing effective? And what's important is that to test whether a sheaf is regular, you just need to test a specific number of vanishing. Okay. And again, as I say, I think this, this concept came up when people were proving these boundedness results. So the theorem of Grotendieck and Kleiman and Mumford and so on is that uh, you can bound the regularity of a sheaf if it's given to you as a subsheaf or a quotient of a given thing just in terms of the Hilbert polynomial. And then since then, and for at least for ideal sheaves, well, let me erase first and not. Uh,
so you need to go to the bottom here, I guess. OK. OK, and so as I say, the, the theorems that people proved in the 60s were that you can uh, essentially bound the regularity of a sheaf just from its Hilbert polynomial. And in fact, for ideal sheaves at least, later on, Gottsman gave the best possible answer. So in some sense, the general, the general picture is kind of well understood. Let me just, to get the numbers straight, let's just write down what this says for ideal sheaves, and then I'll go on to the specific question. So again, if we can, whoops. Maybe I, <laughs> does anybody else have any funny stories? Let me wait for this. Uh, or maybe it's the chalk. Well, okay, let me try this piece. Uh, what? OK. So let's, uh, if we again, let's consider uh, a subwriter or subscheme. OK. And if, uh, and then what we'll do is we call the regular, I don't, again, I don't really care about the regular. The regularity of x is by definition this Casanova Mumford regularity of the ideal sheaf. So what is this saying? So it's saying that if uh, the regularity of x, let's say, is some integer m naught, then uh, in the first place, this says a little bit more than that the x is cut out as a scheme by hypersurfaces of degree m naught. It says actually that the ideal sheaf, the, the homogeneous ideal of x, is generated in degrees less than or equal to m naught, right? Because this condition, see, if we take f to be the ideal sheaf, it says that once you know the degree m part, you know all the higher parts. So uh, is the whole homogeneous ideal is generated in degree m naught or less. And then the h1 vanishing, there's a slight funny shift in indices here because of this sliding condition there. So what it says is that the, the second thing it says is that hypersurfaces of degrees so this is the m naught minus 1 trace out of a complete linear series. OK, so that's what this means. OK. And what we'll see in a, in a, in a couple minutes is that what the regularity of x is actually equivalent to knowing the regularity of x is equivalent not, in this, not only to knowing the degrees of the generators of the ideal, but all the bounding the degrees of all the terms in the uh, minimal resolution of the ideal. So we'll come to that. OK, but so this is all, the, the point though is that this is all very formal. So where does the kind of geometry come in? So the, really, the, the geometric problem then is uh, not necessarily to work out the generalities, but can we? So Again, we're thinking of this regularity as somehow bounding the complexity of the algebraic properties of x. So the problem then is, can we bound the regularity of x uh, in terms of natural geometric or accessible algebraic information? So bound the regularity of x in terms of geometric or uh, let me say, accessible algebraic data. So again, this is a kind of a vague question. The, the, the kind of question we're going to be looking at, well, the accessible algebraic data I'm thinking of is if you know the degrees of the defining equations of a variety. Can you say anything about this regularity? Or the kind of geometric data people look at is if you know the degrees, the degree of the variety itself, can you bound this regularity? OK, and then there's kind of an amazing, a very mysterious thing that happens. It's still not understood. So there's this uh, mysterious dichotomy. Uh, uh, that I think was really kind of the people who, I, I would say, I mean, is kind of really emphasized as an important very influential paper of Beyer and Mumford called What Can Be Computed in Algebraic Geometry. And it, it dates from, the, I think, the late 80s, but it appeared somewhat later. And this mysterious dichotomy that emerges that still isn't really understood is that uh, if you take a nice variety x, for example, smooth, e.g. non-singular, this regularity is bounded linearly in terms of uh, geometric data. So let me just say this regularity 
is, bound, is bounded linearly in terms of the degree of the variety, the degree of the defining equation. So the regularity doesn't grow very fast in terms of the input data. But if you allow arbitrary schemes, but for arbitrary schemes, uh, the regularity can grow very fast. So the regularity can be extremely large. And so I'll, starting a little bit later, I'll talk more about this. But one of the interests, so it's a, this completely different behavior for nice varieties and arbitrary schemes. And I think it's fair to say that people don't really understand why this should be. And another interesting question that isn't really understand is what exactly is the dividing line between nice varieties and arbitrary things. So for example, if you look at, for smooth varieties, those are nice. If you look at, but if you look at reduced and irreducible varieties, what happens? I don't think there's really an answer to that question. So in any event, this is where we're going to head with um, regularity, which I will start talking about after the, the break. Yeah. Well, whatever, I mean, these geometric or accessible algebraic data. So what I'm going to take is the algebraic data, the degrees of the defining equations, or the degree of the variety. And it's linear in both cases. I mean, in terms of the degree of the variety, one doesn't know necessarily the right coefficient. But basically, they're linear bounds. And in, in, for arbitrary schemes, the picture is roughly that they're polynomial in, the degree, in, the, in these data, but a doubly exponential degree, so in these weird examples. So, I mean, I'm being very rough here. I'm just trying to, so, but it's, the, the, what the picture is, it's linear versus crazy, crazy bounds. And, uh, OK. No, it's, it's, so for arbitrary, let me, I'm, I'm going to talk, let me, let, me, let, me, let me wait till the second half, and I'll state some actual, I think it's, OK. Am I supposed to wash this, or do we just go ahead? I, I mean, new water. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I see. Okay. I really think we should have, you know, there should be a, okay. Yeah, right. This was the, this, foot, this basketball game was the game right before uh, Thanksgiving, and they were also throwing turkeys <laughs> into the stand. <laughs> I don't know. I guess we can't do that. That we can't really uh, <laughs> hope to match. I see, but you certainly can't read chalk. It's okay. Okay. Okay, so this is the answer to the first question. The second uh, question was about these uh, defining equations of curves as you get more and more positive embedding. So let me tell you, oh, I've really made a mess of this. Well, what can you do? Okay, so, and this brings us to the second topic, this question of syzygies. So let me recall what the classical uh, statement we had earlier was. So C and PR is a curve uh, embedded by a, a curve embedded by a line bundle of degree D. And uh, so the statement was that if, uh, if D is at least 2G plus 1, then uh, C is projectively normal. And if uh, D is at least 2G plus 2, then the ideal of C is generated by quadrics. And the question was, uh, uh, what happens if we go up to degree 2G plus 3, for example? And the person who realized what was going on here uh, in the early 80s was Mark Green. So what he realized is that you should see these classical results. Uh, so these are the first, these classical results 
are the first cases uh, more general, very general, much more general statements for higher syzygies. First cases. I think what I'm messing up here is I'm getting my chalk wet. I think that's where I'm. Okay. So these are the first cases of uh, of more general statements for higher syzygy. So let me talk. So as I say, this was in the early 80s that people began to understand uh, what was really happening here. Let me see if I can. Am I allowed to mix these metaphors here a little bit, or is this going to? OK. So uh, let me, st rather than do it, there's a certain amount of notation and indexing involved. So let me explain this picture in the first non-classical case. So still looking at a curve, let's assume that uh, D is at least 2G plus 3. So what happens in this first non-classical case? Well, what we already know is that the ideal of the curve is generated by quadrics. So let's take some quadratic generators. So take generators, take quadratic generators, uh, Q alpha in the homogeneous ideal. So these are quadrics that generate the homogeneous ideal of this curve. Now, of course, we're going to assume that these are linearly independent, considered as elements in the vector space of all quadrics. But there will be, of course, polynomial relations among these, relations among these with, whose coefficients are polynomials in higher degree. And so the first case of the, of the theorem that Green proved is that when you go to degree 2g plus 3 or higher, the relations have, are generated by syzygies with, whose coefficients have lowest possible degree. So then the assertion is that then the module of syzygies among the Q alphas are generated by relations of the form of the form summation L alpha Q alpha equals zero, where and this is the important thing, the degree the L alphas are linear polynomials. So in other words, once you go to degree two G plus three, uh, the relations among the, the relations among the quadratic generators are kind of as simple as possible in terms of degree. So again, I'm not maybe I don't want to write anything down, but it, you probably know if you take a cubic curve, rational cubic curve in P3, right? The twisted cubic in P3 is gen it's given by the two by three two by two minors of a two by three matrix. So it's generated by three quadrics, and there are three relations among them that have linear coefficients. Two relations that have linear coefficients. But if you take an elliptic curve of degree 4 in P3, so that's, that's to, for an elliptic curve, that's 2G plus 2, but not 2G plus 3. It's a complete intersection of two quadrics. So that's generated by quadrics, but the only relation among the quadrics is the Kazool relation. So the coefficients there have degree 2, not degree 1. So that's the kind of picture that happens. And in general, uh, so let me sort of state the theorem, state Green's theorem. Uh, so what Green proved, and then, so, so let me just explain. Uh, if you take if each relation of this form is indexed, the coefficients, the L alphas form a vector of linear forms that give you a relation. And so each relation is indexed given is described by a vector of, of linear forms. And then you can look at the relations among the vectors. So you can look at the relations among the relations. And then Green showed that if you go up to 2G plus 4, the relations among the relations themselves have linear coefficients and so on. So in general, what he showed is that if the degree of the line bundle is at least 2G plus 1 plus K, that's how I'm going to index things, then, uh, then uh, the first K modules of syzygies So I, of syzygies um, of uh, the ideal are generated in lowest possible degree. So generated in lowest possible degree k plus 1. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I mean until you run out until you run out of until you run out of right. I mean of course the length of the resolution stops at a certain point. Right. 
But a actually, the rational curves are the only ones where there's no statement, where it's linear forever. <laughs> like an elliptic curve, this stops. Anyway, let, let me not, we'll, I'll come to all the precise statement later. And I'm indexing, I mean, normally, I mean, again, I'm, I don't want to get into a big, I'm calling generators of IC first syzygies, which is not really how you normally index, but that's how I want to do the statement here. So anyway, so here, if we do 2G plus, if K is equal to 1, then the generators have degree K plus 1, which is 2. If the, um, uh, again, again I, where is this K plus 1? I mean, the linear core, I, I don't want to get too much into indices here. It'll, it'll become clear. <laughs> so I'm thinking of a linear, the way people normally, if you, I'm looking at the module, I'm really looking at the projective resolution of these things, and then the generators of this thing really have that degree. So the indexing is a little bit confusing, and we'll, we'll kind of jump off that bridge when we get there. But this is what it's saying, that as, you, as the positivity gets higher and higher, the resolution stays linear in this sense longer and longer. And there's a name for this. It's normally called property NK. So uh, again, I apologize for writing it there. So property NK just means the first case syzygies have this kind of linearity property. OK, so this, was, this is the theorem that kind of, uh, that kind of um, um, clarifies these classical results. And, um, OK, so we're, this is by now a very elementary theorem, and we'll certainly go through it. But what I really want to talk about are what are the kind of outgrowths of this, and where does this, maybe it's not quite classical yet, but this was kind of the beginning of this story. And there's been a lot of work since then. So uh, let me. Uh, OK, so what, is, what are the out further developments of this story on um, syzygies? So, uh, well, OK. So what are some of the further developments that we'll talk about? OK, so first of all, uh, I mean, these are not exactly clear what order to. So this was Green's theorem. I mean, that some, somehow started the whole. So I, sh I should say that Green was not necessarily only interested in syzygies. He developed this whole machinery that he then applied to um, a lot of make interesting infinitesimal computations in Hodge theory. But just in terms of this syzygy thing, so the first thing you can try to do is you can try to extend this kind of statement to other varieties. So the first sort of circle of ideas is extend Green's theorem to other varieties. other sorts of varieties. So what you want is kind of reasonably effective statements. So for example, the, uh, I'll say a little bit about this. But so for example, Presky, Presky and then, uh, well, he developed and turned it into a theory with Popa. They studied the case of a billion variety. So if you take uh, x theta, it doesn't need to be principally polarized, but a polarized a billion variety. Then uh, the theorem is that uh, the Presky's theorem is that if we take k plus three times a polarization, this satisfies this property n sub k. So four times the polarization is cut up by quadrics. The ideal is drained by quadrics. Five times the polarization, the the uh, the uh, the um, Syzygies are linear and so on. So this is kind of the, this, the case k equals uh, 1 is essentially this work of Mumford and Kempf on a billion varieties cut out by quadrics. You can also look for, so with ein, 
you can give a kind of a statement for arbitrary, so on an arbitrary smooth, I don't want an arbitrary smooth Xn, you can use van. So yeah, I'm going to talk about this. This uses uh, Fourier Mukai transforms, basically. Uh, and this, I mean, that's how Presky did it, and then Presky Popa developed this, used the ideas there for this whole theory, this whole story of M regularity. Um, you can use vanishing theorems for vector bundles, so use vanishing theorems uh, for vector bundles to show, uh, so what is the best, so what you'd do is look at something of the form, so what's the analog of large degree line bundles on a curve? So you look at basically canonical plus some multiple of something positive. So if I've got the numbers right, n plus 1 plus k times very ample, so something very ample. So if you take a line bundle of this form, then this satisfies to show this satisfies this property n sub k. So if you take a line bundle of the form, let's see, if we take k equal 1, k, um, k plus n plus 2 times a very ample thing that's cut up by quadrant. The ideal is joined by quadrants, k plus n plus 3, and so on. OK. So in any event, there are various things that you can do other things. But there's a kind of a slogan that you want to sort of take away from this, is that as you increase the positivity, uh, somehow this property nk, this linearity property of the resolution, this uh, holds linearly in the, in the positivity of L. So the slogan of all of this is that this property uh, nk holds linearly in the positivity of L. So here, the positivity in curves, the positivity is measured by degree. Here, it's measured by uh, multiple, multiple of a principle of a polarization. Here, it's me measured by how many times a very ample thing you throw on. So as you kind of increase the positivity, uh, you get this kind of linear growth in where you can control the first cases. And just, okay. Now, OK, so that's one circle of ideas. Uh, another circle of ideas, another further development, is you can go back to the case of curves and you can try to find a uh, sort of fine structure in the case of curves. So, uh, so B, let me just say fine structure of syzygies of curves. So this is the most famous question here is, of course, uh, uh, is, of course, uh, Green's conjecture on canonical curves. So Mark Green, in the same paper, made a very influential uh, of canonical curves. So you, um, you take a curve and you embed it by canonical linear series, and then Green's conjecture was that in a very precise way, you can read off what special divisors the curve carries from the grading of the resolution. So this is a very famous conjecture. And the essential progress to date is due to voisin. So this is Green's conjecture, uh, voisin's theorem. So she proved it basically for general curves and then with sort of many special cases of curves, special curves. Uh, there was a related conjecture that if you take, uh, which is actually now a theorem, so let me call this Ganality theorem. Uh, which said that if you could, uh, which says essentially that you can you can read off the ganality of a curve from the syzygies of any one line bundle with sufficiently large degree. So you can read off off ganality of a curve from syzygies of any one of any line bundle of degree very large. So if you give me a sufficiently large degree line bundle on a curve and tell me what the resolution looks like, I can tell you what the ganality of the curve is. So this was kind of, well, so the story here is that what, what Claire did is that she uh, so uses, uses the geometry of the Hilbert scheme of a K3 surface. Well, for, so for the general canonical curve. Um, and I'm not one of the three or four people in the world that have actually penetrated what she's, <laughs> so I'm certainly not going to describe in detail her, 
work. But it turns out you can see quite clearly why the syzygies are located in here. And it turns out that if you go down a dimension, you can see this canality thing kind of pops out much simple, more simply than anybody would. It's kind of a little bit funny story. Or in the case for the second one, it's basically sim of the curve. Okay, so this I will go through in detail. So this is, I'll show you how some computations on the sim vector bundles on the symmetric product of a curve lead to a kind of a surprisingly quick proof of this canality uh, conjecture. Canality term. Okay, so that's, and then the third direction um, I want to say a little bit about at the end is, um, is uh, okay, so what we said so far is that this, uh, this property NP, the NK, this kind of linear growth uh, this kind of uh, this kind of linear piece of the resolution holds somehow linearly in the positivity. Uh, this doesn't feel very dry yet. Let's see. I think I haven't mastered this. Okay, so. Okay, so um, then the last kind of thing I want to discuss a little bit is uh, uh, well, okay. So let me just say the asymptotic structure of uh, of syzygies of a smooth n-dimensional variety. Uh, embedded uh, as positivity as positivity of the embedding growth. So this is the last uh, So let me just quickly say uh, what the idea is. So see the idea here is that let's take uh, on xn, we'll take uh, let's consider something of the form, a line bundle of the form. L sub D, I don't exactly care what it is. Let's say D times apple, where A is apple. So again, the picture is always to look at, let the positivity grow linearly in some variable. So I'll just take it multiple of apple. Now, what we've kind of seen is that this property NK holds uh, more or less linearly for K satisfying some bound that's linear in D. So linearly in D. That's the kind of thing we talked about there. But you see, uh, this is really coming back to this thing that, that Nick Addington asked. So how many syzygies are there? So the, the point is that the, the number of possible syzygy modules grows like the dimension of the linear series. But, but uh, the number of you know, syzygy modules that exist, the length of the resolution, syzygy modules uh, is roughly well, it's the, basically, it's like, it's like H naught of L sub D, which is growing like D to the dimension. So these, N, these, these kind of extensions of Green's theorem control a linear number of syzygies. But the number of syzygies, once you're in dimension two or higher, the number of potential syzygies is growing as a polynomial of higher degree. And then it turns out that um, in somehow what happens, in fact, for most of the syzygies, you get a completely different picture. So what turns out? And we'll talk about this. Is that for most p, uh, and for most values of p, uh, syzygy modules have the syz the p th module of p syzygies uh, has generators and has generators in the most number of degrees in all possible degrees. Well, the only possible degrees, as it turns out in all possible degrees, uh, let me say, 1 through n. So I'm being a little bit vague here, but 1 through n. 
So in other words, these green type results says that the, you get generators in the fewest, very only one degree. But you see, these green type results in higher dimension only cover a few of the syzygy modules. And what turns out is if you look asymptotically, the kind of asymptotic picture is that once you're kind of away from this green range, the picture is completely opposite. You get generators there's kind of, in terms of degrees of generators, the syzygies are as complicated as possible. And there are various interesting conjectures. So for, let me just mention one and then we'll take the break. So this is, uh, then you can, so this is a conjecture with, uh, with er, uh, I and Dan Ehrman. Uh, you can then, for example, look at the dimensions of the syzygy modules. And the claim is that the, the conjecture is that, and so I'm going to be vague, the dimension of syzygy modules, these what are called the Betty numbers of the resolutions, become normally distributed. Uh, if you normalize them properly, become normally uh, distributed as d goes to infinity. So somehow there really is some, the, the, can, the picture is that there's some kind of uniform behavior to sort of uh, interesting uniform behavior to this kind of equation, the syzygies of the equations defining higher dimensional varieties as you, um, as you uh, take very positive embeddings. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, I went a little bit uh, long, but that, that's the sort of overview of where I'm hoping to go. And so maybe after the break, we'll really start talking about Casanova Mumford Riggle. I'll try to prove some stuff. And so the plan is the second half today and then most of tomorrow, we'll talk about Casanova Mumford regularity, including proofs of some elementary things, and then maybe start talking about these syzygies and equations. Uh, Thursday, yeah, right, next, next, next lecture. Okay. So now there's coffee somewhere, I think. Is there? Oh, okay. But, but, but you wanted a Their plan was to take a break, right? The plan was to take a break. Yeah, okay. Yeah.